Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. All right. Any anniversaries? We got an anniversary. All right. How many years? 57 years. Well, stand up. Y'all ready? Y'all been waiting on this, haven't you? You been ready? Happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy, 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 happy anniversary, happy, 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 happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. All right. All right. Oh, my goodness. And I guess if somebody, y'all going to take up an offering? We've got all this Wednesday stuff out of the way. Nobody's getting offering plates. So. Uh, Tim's getting offering plates. There we go. All righty. While Tim's getting the offering plates, let's see what's going on here. We are way over here in the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, let me, let's, uh, let's see if you've been paying attention. Let's see if you've been paying attention. Uh, we've. We've said so far in Leviticus chapter 23, there are how many feasts? Seven. And there are, what's the, what's the breakdown? There are how many in the spring? Four in the spring. And let's see, let me do my math. That leaves three in the fall, doesn't it? That's right. Let me get my shoes off here. All right. Uh, four in the spring, three in the fall. What are the four spring feasts? <laughs> no. We're, we're seeing if you're paying attention. Let's see, we're going to do them in order. Okay, we're going to do them in order, okay? The first one is Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks. All righty, so those are the four spring feasts. What's the significance of those? They were fulfilled in Christ's ministry in his first advent. He came and became that Passover lamb. He was put in the grave. Uh, as the unleavened bread, he was raised on first fruits, and on uh, Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, uh, the Holy Spirit came. The church was born, and it completed Christ's ministry as far as his first advent. So now we've moved to the fall feast. We've jumped ahead now to the seventh. What is the the seventh month? If you start from Abib, but it's really the sort of the first month in the calendar year because Rosh Hashanah is actually the Jewish New Year. So the first of Tishri uh, is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. And we started last week, we looked at that, and we found out that God just, as opposed to some of the other things that were tied in to the history and to the agriculture, what was going on there, when they came to the Feast of First Fruits, I mean the Feast of Trumpets, God just said, on the first day of Tishri, blow the trumpets. And it's going to be a day of holy convocation. They had some special offerings that they were going to bring. Uh, but we said it was the first of the feast that was not tied in to either something agricultural or something historical. But what else did we say that was significant about it? Okay, it is, this, we are prophetic now. We did say that. That's good. This, was his, this is historical. This has already happened, not hysterical now, but historical. This is historical. This is prophetic. This is yet to come. This is when he comes back again. But we said there was one other thing significant about the Feast of Trumpets. That it's the one that comes on the first day of the month. And because it comes on the first day of the month, in the Jewish calendar, it's always on a new moon because that's what signals the first day of the month. They're on a lunar calendar. Every one of their months starts on the new moon. By the way, I found out something just this past week because of a Jewish calendar that Miss Rita brought me. Uh, we talked about whenever we were discussing the months. Remember when we got out here to Adar, we said that every so often, and I think it turns out to be like every three or four years, they have a, an additional month. They have to add in an extra month in order to keep the seasons lined up correctly. Well, it just so happens that this year there will be an Adar 2. Uh, so they will, when they come to the end of the month of Adar, they'll have another month of Adar. They'll have Adar 2 before they go back to the, the month of Abib. So, all right. So that's just an interesting little thing there. Okay, so we started talking about the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, I told you last week that we weren't going to get through. And sure enough, we didn't. We did not make
make it through. I knew that we wouldn't. Uh, and I actually have another rabbit or two that we're going to chase tonight. We're going to try to get through the Feast of Trumpets. So let me tell you what we've talked about so far. We've discussed the fact, you know, that Rosh Hashanah means the head of the years because it is the beginning of the year. We talked about the blowing in the trumpets. We said it was probably the shofar that they were going to be blowing because that's the trumpet that's also blown on the Day of Atonement. We'll see that. Uh, and then we began, as we looked at the sounding of the trumpets, we took a little different trek than what we have taken in some of the other studies. And I told you two reasons last week why we did, why we did that. Normally what I've been doing in the studies is I would give you the sort of the Jewish perspective, and we'd go through that, and then I would go back and show you in terms of the application how that the fulfillment of that was fulfilled here in the ministry of Christ and how it will be fulfilled in the second advent of Christ. But uh, knowing that we weren't going to get through, I didn't want to just leave you with, with just the Jewish aspect because, first of all, there was, there's not a whole lot to talk about. Because, again, the other thing that I said last week is because this is not tied to anything historical or, or anything in, the, in, the, in regards to that, there's not a whole lot to say. Uh, most of it has to do with how the use of the trumpets in the Old Testament becomes a fulfillment of the second coming, whenever Christ comes back. Remember we talked about last week, just in case uh, some of you weren't here or in case you've forgotten, as far as our, our prophetic timeline here, we're, we're out here at the Feast of Trumpets, but this fe the, we know that the Feast of Trumpets can happen tomorrow. First of all, I'll, I'll show, I'm, I'm confident it's going to happen on, on the first of Tishri. Uh, there's no reason to think that if Jesus actually died on Passover and was actually in the grave during unleavened bread and actually rose on the Feast of First Fruits and the Holy Spirit actually came on Shavuot, there's no reason to believe that the coming that's represented by the Feast of Trumpets is not going to be fulfilled on Rosh Hashanah. So I, I believe that, again, as I said last week, that he's coming back here. Not the second coming. This is not the rapture. The rapture is taking place sometime in here, and then we have a seven-year-plus period of time between the rapture and the time that Christ comes back at the close of the tribulation period, uh, whenever he comes back, not for the church, but with the church uh, as he comes back here. So that helps you a little bit with the timeline there. Let me, sort of, uh, let me see if I can bring you up to date real quickly. Those of you that weren't here last week, we talked about the fact that the trumpet was associated with the presence of God. We saw some scriptures there in the Exodus and then the, we, over in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, we also saw that John the Revelator was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He heard a voice. It was, it was a great trumpet, uh, and it was the Alpha and Omega that was there on the island with him. Uh, then we said it was the call to battle, uh, and we looked at some scriptures uh, again in Numbers where it was talking about the call to battle, but then we talked about that as what one of the things that's going to happen Whenever this trumpet sounds and Christ comes back, is what? Armageddon. The great battle of Armageddon is going to take place here. So we looked at that. And I think that's as far as we got, isn't it? Okay. So the next thing that you have in your notes then is that the trumpet in the Old Testament was associated with days of holy significance. In other words, they were it announced the holy days. It announced whenever something special was going to happen. Uh, I'm going to read these passages. You've got them in your notes. You're not going to have time, I don't think, to, to find them. So you're just going to have to trust me. But you can, yes. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, because of the way that we were going to do the lesson, the, the notes that you have, the, the green verses are what we would normally have called the application verses. So in other words, you have the verses that are in the black lettering, that are going to relate to some of the Old Testament passages that we see associated with the use of trumpets. And then if we were going to make application to this Feast of Trumpets, then you would find those in green. Okay, so thank you for, for reminding me about that. So, as we look at the trumpet associated with the announcement of days of holy significance, back in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offering and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings, 
that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So he said, blow the trumpets on this. Do you have Psalms 81.3 in your notes? Because I added this to mine. Okay, so you've got that in there. Here's what Psalms 81.3 says. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. So here we have the trumpets again, just associated with these holy days, these days of holy convocation. Well, what does the Bible tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52? There's going to come a day of some pretty significance. It's going to be a pretty significant day. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 talks about in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So we see that trumpet there associated with the coming of the Lord. Now again, specifically I believe for us, that resurrection and the change takes place at the rapture here, uh, but also there's going to be uh, there's a, a resurrection here. Remember the those that have died during the tribulation period, and, and I believe possibly, I wasn't, I'm not prepared to get into this in detail tonight, but possibly even the Old Testament saints are resurrected here as opposed to this being the church. I did mention last week, and again, we're not going to get into detail on this. We may can come back to this at some point in time. By the way, this is a good time to tell you that uh, I'm, what I'm thinking, we've got two more uh, feasts after tonight, which I think we're going to be able to cover each one in one night. So we've got maybe two more weeks after tonight. For a couple of weeks after that, if you guys are open to it and if you're interested, uh, whenever we meet on Wednesday night, we will have uh, some time of question and answer. So if you want to go ahead and be thinking about your questions, and if you'll get those into me ahead of time, that'll give me a chance to look up the answers. <laughs> and we'll have, a, we'll have some good discussion. We'll have some question answers for a couple of weeks if y'all will get me some good questions, all righty? So, on anything, questions on anything, uh, preferably from the Bible. <laughs> okay? All right. So, these days of holy significance. Then we come to number four, and we find out that the trumpet is associated with the coming of the Lord specifically in judgment. In judgment. Notice what these passages say from the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 98, verses 6 and 9. With trumpets and the sound of cornet make a joyful noise before the Lord the King, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. And then in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath never been any ever the light, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations." So the blowing of the trumpet had to do with God coming specifically in judgment. Now, here's one of the little rabbits we're going to chase here. Uh, you've, heard of some, you've heard of some judgments. You know that there's some judgments in the Bible. You know that there's the, the great white throne judgment, okay, which is the judgment seat of Christ. There's the judgment of the fallen angels. There's the judgment of Israel that's going to take place during the seven-year tribulation period. There's the judgment of our sins that took place on the cross at Calvary. And there's the judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations. Uh, turn with me to... Let's see what we're going to get here. Matthew 21, she said. Did I, not put, that, did I put that in your notes? Ah, well, that's good because I didn't put it in my notes. Actually, what Matthew chapter twenty-four verse thirty-one says, and he shall sound, uh, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. I tell you what, let me back up because there's a, a verse preceding this that actually establishes the timeline for us. Uh, we, we didn't mention that there was a. Um, a resurrection that was associated with this time. Back in Matthew chapter 24, if we back up to verse 27, it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, are y'all with me? Y'all trying to find me here? Matthew uh, 24, 
Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So again, we see that, that trumpet call there that announces the, the coming of the Lord and his coming for judgment. Now I'm still looking for the passage here. I bet that's it. It is. Thank you. And I don't know why I didn't put that in my notes. I put it in your notes, but I didn't put it in mine. That doesn't that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay. I'm glad I put it in somebody's, though. Okay, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, this is interesting here because how many of you have, uh, I'm sure most of you have probably sang the old song, There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Remember singing that? Well, <laughs> she hadn't sang this. It's really a song. I didn't just make that up. It's really a song. Uh, that song, uh, unless you understand specifically Matthew chapter 25, that song is, is uh, it comes from a, scri from a scriptural uh, inaccuracy because it really I believe that the person that wrote the song believes in what's called a general judgment that there's going to come a day that everybody's going to be gathered together and and the saved are going to be put over on one side and the left are going to be put over another but we actually know from other places in scripture and from the timing of those judgments that we talked about earlier I believe the judgment seat of Christ Immediately after the rapture, I believe we go to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we're going to be judged. There aren't going to be any unbelievers there. Paul talks about the, the judgment seat of Christ, and he talks about that day whenever our works are going to be tried. Remember, there's going to be works of gold and silver and precious stone and works of wood and hay and stubble that are going to be there, and they're going to be tried so as by fire. And if any man's work shall uh, abide, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. This is believers that are at the judgment seat of Christ, and the judgment there is going to be for our service, not for sin, but for our service. And based on our service, we will either receive a reward or we'll suffer loss of reward but everybody there is going to be saved, even those that lose their reward. They're going to be saved so as by fire. So there's no lost people here. The great white throne judgment is actually way out here. <laughs> after the thousand-year reign, after the millennial, the great white throne judgment takes place when he opens up the books and the other book is open, which is the book of life, and the, the dead are judged out of those things which are written in the books. Uh, and everyone's name who's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. That's the great white throne judgment. There are no believers there. So there are no unbelievers here. There are no believers there. So where is the judgment where the saints and the sinners are parted right and left? Judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations. So this is what we have in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, again, he gives us the timeline in verse 20 and 31 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him so again this is not the rapture this is when he comes in his glory then shall he set upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Now I'm going to read just enough of this so that you pick up on it. I'm not going to read you know, all 15 verses that are associated with this. 
but he begins to say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was in sick, uh, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we you like this? And the king shall answer in verse 40, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Now, again, this is not a study of the judgment of the nations, uh, but I will say to you that I believe what is happening here as we look at this passage, uh, and again, it's been misinterpreted, I think, a lot because it's been applied to, to the other judgments. But this is a very specific judgment, and they are being judged here based on their treatment of who Jesus refers to as my brethren. Now, who might that be? The Jews. They've just come out of the tribulation period when the Jewish people, and again, those that were saved during the tribulation period, have been extremely mistreated, hunted down. Uh, they have been, as we said before, enemies of the state. So what I believe is happening here is that Jesus is saying there, there's a, something special that's going on here. Because you've just come out of the tribulation period, uh, a reflection of your heart is going to be how you responded to those who were God's children, God's followers during the tribulation period. How did you treat these people who were enemies of the state? Because in essence, to be sympathetic to them and to treat them kindly, to feed them whenever they were hungry, to give them drink, to visit them, to minister to them, is to take their side against who? Against the Antichrist. The Antichrist is ruling here, and he's persecuting them. So in order for you to take their side, you've got to stand against the Antichrist. And so the reward here is based on, I, I still believe it's based on your heart. He refers to these people later on as righteous, uh, and I believe that they are righteous, but their righteousness is reflected in their actions in terms of how they treated the persecuted during the time of the tribulation period. And based on that, they are allowed to enter into the millennial kingdom. Now, again, we don't have time to get into a lot of detail. I'll give you a little teaser about something that maybe we can talk about during our question and answer period. Uh, I don't believe that these people have glorified bodies. I believe that, and, you know, and, and again, this is opinion. This is just opinion. Uh, I believe that these people are some of the people who go into the millennial kingdom in the bodies of like Adam and Eve had before the fall. Okay? They're not glorified bodies. They're not going to be a body like the Lord Jesus, like the church is going to have, but they're going to be a body like the original bodies were, and they're going to be allowed to go into the millennial kingdom. A couple of reasons why I say that. Again, I think I mentioned last week, uh, during the millennium, uh, somebody's going to be having kids. Because the Bible talks about children during the millennial kingdom. You know, the weaned child shall put his whole and put his hand in the cockatrice den, and and so there's going to be, you know, small children that are there that are going to be born during the millennial kingdom. Well, it's not going to be the church, because God has already said that in our glorified bodies that we're going to be uh, as the angels of heaven and are not going to be marrying or giving in marriage, but somebody's going to be. And I believe that one of those groups that's going to be doing that are these are the sheep that from the judgment of the nations are allowed to go into the millennial kingdom. So that's a lot That's a lot to absorb. We can come back to that some later time. But really the gist of what I'm saying now is that one of the things associated with the trumpets is he's coming as the judge. And so one of the first things he's going to do that we saw in Matthew chapter 25, he's going to sit on the judgment throne. All the nations are going to be gathered before him, and he's going to divide them as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goat. So it's a call, it's associated with God coming with judgment. Uh, next, 
It is a call to repentance. It's a call to repentance. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice as a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. So it's calling for a time of, of repentance. Uh, we Back in Zechariah chapter 3, I think we read some of this possibly last week, but turn back over. Let me show you one verse in Zechariah chapter 3. And again, this is the next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest thou, and thy fellows that sit before thee, for their men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice the last phrase. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Um, I wish we had a little bit more time here. And again, maybe we can come back to this. But as we think about this being associated with repentance... I mentioned this maybe very briefly last week, uh, but didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. You'll notice there are 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. These 10 days are known as the 10 days of all. The 10 days of all. And it's a time uh, for introspection. We're coming up on the Day of Atonement here, and then we're, we'll talk about that next week, the significance of that. I believe this is the day in terms of the forgiveness of sins. But the ten days approaching that are days for the Jews to look within themselves uh, and see if there's anything that they need to repent of as they approach the Day of Atonement. So this, this whole period of time here, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets and leading up to the Day of Atonement, are days of national repentance, national soul searching. Uh, so we see it associated with repentance. Uh, let me go ahead. This is probably a good time. I'm jumping around on the outline, but if you'll notice uh, under the significance of the time, uh, do you see your notes there where it talks about the casting ceremony? Uh, tejlik. Tejlik. Do you see that? The casting ceremony? Probably on your second page. The casting ceremony here takes place here again as we approach the Day of Atonement. And literally what they would do is they would they will go out to a body of water and they will have in their in their pockets or in their in their cloak, they will have uh, stones. Uh, sometimes pieces of bread. Uh, they will have something in their pockets, and they will go out to this body of water, and it could be a pond or a lake or the sea or wherever they may have a body of water, and they will take those things out of the pockets and cast those into that water. And the significance there is that, again, we're on this day of repentance. We are ridding ourselves of our sin. We are confessing our sins, and we are claiming the promise that, first of all, they are cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. That's the reason why they're cast into a body of water. And then they are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. And so they cast those in there as they confess their sins. And it is again that time of repentance. Let me just share something. Where's, uh, where's Robbie? There he is. I think, I don't know if I mentioned this to you Sunday morning or not. I almost said this. I told Cindy last night, this was, this, I don't know if this is coincidental or if it's a God thing or what, but he used an illustration Sunday morning in Sunday school that's sort of an odd illustration. I mean, it's not one that you think about a lot, 
but I had just been thinking about that Sunday morning before we went to church, and I don't even know what, what led my mind to it, but he was talking about the significance of the fact that God said he's going to separate our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. And the significance of that is that he didn't say, I'm going to separate them as far as the north is from the south. But, huh? Yeah, because, because there's a place where the north and the south come together. You can go north till you get to the North Pole, and then any direction that you go from there is south. Uh, and the same way whenever you go to the South Pole. But if you go east, there's never a time that you start going west. I mean, you just keep going east and the same thing. And so the Bible says he's going to separate our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Now, that's where that old saying comes from. The east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. And so they're, they're, they're celebrating this casting of their sins. You've got some scriptures there associated with it. Uh, the synagogue services for Rosh Hashanah, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Let's go back and finish. Up. Let's go back and finish up the trumpets. I've only, I think we've only got a couple more. First of all, it's associated with the gathering of God's people. Amen. The trumpet call is associated with the gathering of God's people. Uh, back in uh, Numbers chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13, And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet will be blown, and they shall come from which they were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcast in the land of Egypt, and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. So we see the trumpets for the calling of God's people. Now we've already seen, we've already read the passage there in Matthew where it talks about the trumpet's going to sound. He's going to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. They're all going to be gathered together there. Uh, and that's the scripture that you have in Matthew chapter 24. So we've actually already read this. I will just say this. Um, what a time. Now we're going to have to get out. We really have to get out to here before we're going to experience the very first in all the history of the world, the very first assembly of all of God's children. The Old Testament saints, the church of the New Testament, the tribulation saints are all going to be gathered. You talk about a family reunion. Uh, everybody's going to be there whenever the trumpet sounds for the Feast of Trumpets. And then finally... The trumpet is associated with the coronation of a new king. Um, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39, And Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet. And all the people said, God save King Solomon. Uh, some of the other verses, if you have 2 Kings 9 and 11 and 2 Samuel chapter 15, these are other passages that refer to the sounding of the trumpet whenever a king was anointed. So uh, guess what? Guess what? Uh, whenever this trumpet sounds, it's going to announce a new kingdom. He's going to come back, the Bible said, and he's going to reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. One of my favorite passages in the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, whenever they're rejoicing. And here's what they're rejoicing about. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God. <laughs> You know, you're seeing a lot of things that are, uh, a lot of things that we look around in the world today. We see what's happening over in Russia. We see what's happening in China. We see what's happening in, in Korea. We see what's happening in America. I mean, we see what's happening all around the world. But, oh, listen, listen to me. There's going to come, there's going to come a day whenever the kingdoms of this world are going to be the kingdoms of our God. Uh, we're going to anoint a king. You know, there's so many passages that we could look at. Right now, my mind is going to whenever the angel appeared to Mary, and he said uh, he's going to be called the son of the highest, and he's going to sit on the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Uh, there's, just, there's just so much there. As we look back at the significance of these days, and, and I've, I've tried to as I've gone through here, I've tried to show you how that God established the significance of the days. We look back, we talked about the fact that the Jews believed that the first Shavuot was what? Anybody remember? What happened on the first Shavuot? The giving of the law. 
whenever Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. So the first Shavuot began the dispensation of the law. This Shavuot began the dispensation of grace. It was the end of the dispensation of the law and started the dispensation of grace. This Feast of Trumpets will signal the dispensation of the kingdom, the kingdom age. So whenever we talk about days of holy significance, I mean, these are, these are days whenever major changes are taking place in, in what's happening in the world and, and, and how that God is dealing with the world even. So I have a note down here from, from the writings of the ancient rabbis in Rosh Hashanah 11 is the quote, in the month of Nisan, our ancestors were redeemed, referring to Passover and then being brought out of bondage, and in Tishri, they shall be redeemed in the time to come. So that's actually in the writings of the rabbis. All right, let's go back and see what I've missed now. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we missed anything. We went back, we covered all the trumpets, we talked about the significance of the times and the, the casting ceremony. Okay, here's one thing that I skipped over that I said we would come back to. Uh, the synagogue services for Rosh Hashanah um, center around three different themes, and I think I've got this in your notes as well, so we haven't talked about that. First of all, it has to do with kingship. Kingship. Uh, it's emphasizing God's majesty, his position as the king of the universe. Uh, the benediction for Rosh Hashanah is as follows. May all the inhabitants of the world realize and know that to thee every knee must bow, every tongue must bow allegiance. The Lord shall be king forever and ever. That's the benediction associated with Rosh Hashanah. And then secondly, a time of remembrance, that God remembers his everlasting covenant with Israel. And I'll tell you that benediction in just a second. Let me just mention to you, um, really from, from, here, from here out, we've got a, uh, whenever we talk about this as being a time of remembrance, let's see, how do, where do I want to start to say this? The Old Testament primarily is God's dealing with Israel. We know that right. It's not that Gentiles could not be saved. As a matter of fact, God blessed Israel with the idea that they would be a light to the Gentiles and that they would be a light to the world. So, but, but it basically has to do with God's dealing with Israel. But when you come to Daniel's prophecy about the 70 weeks, it talks about the fact that the first 69 of those weeks are going to carry us up to the time of Christ's crucifixion. And then Messiah shall be cut off. But then there's a 70th week. That's that 70th seven of years that's out here. This, this is sometimes referred to as Daniel's 70th week. Because this is the 70 of those 70 years that were prophesied in Daniel. We can talk about that some other time. But this is the seven years. But my point is this. God dealt with Israel up until the time that they rejected Christ. And it was as if at that point God pushed the pause button. Uh, he had a multi-line phone. And he, and he put them on hold. And he dialed up the Gentiles. And starting, huh? Uh, actually, the, the hardening even took place that resulted in the crucifixion. You know, they, they, their hearts were hardened, their eyes were blinded, that they did not see him as the Messiah, and he was cut off. And so now for 2,000 years, God's focus has been on the church. If you remember, one of the things we said when we did our study of the seven churches is that in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, it's all about the church, all the letters to the seven churches. But then we come to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and the Spirit says to John, come up hither, and from then until the time of the return, the church is never mentioned again. So now we're in the 70th week of God's dealing with Israel. So I said all that to say, 
as we think about remembrance, as we think about remembrance, two things. Number one, I hope there's not anybody here that, that's into this replacement theology. Replacement theology is that belief that, that God has replaced Israel with the church and he's going to fulfill all of his prophecies in the church. Hath God cast away his people whom he foreknew? God forbid. Uh, so, so Paul tells us that. But what's happened here is they've been on hold now for 2,000 years, but starting right here, he's going to go back to line one. He's going to go back and he's going to pick up his dealing. And so what I'm saying is he is going to remember his covenant. He has not forgotten the covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. We make promises that if a certain amount of time goes by, we may forget them. God doesn't forget. He's going to fulfill the promise. And what he promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is that the land that he was going to give them was going to be theirs for an everlasting possession and so here God is going to remember his covenant and he's going to go back and he's going to fulfill those promises that he made to Abraham Isaac and Jacob as he sets up the kingdom here and they're going to have the land that God promised them so it's a time of remembrance uh, the benediction remember in our behalf O Lord our God the covenant the kindness and the solemn promise which thou didst make to our father Abraham on Mount Moriah and then finally, it's a recognition of the significance of the shofar, the sounding of the trumpet, uh, the benediction. The whole world trembled at thy presence. Creation shook in all before thee. When thou art king, didst reveal thyself on Mount Sinai. Amid the blasting of the shofar, didst thou appear to them. So all of these things then we're looking forward to in terms of this fulfillment of this Rosh Hashanah this Feast of Trumpets, which will be fulfilled at the Lord's return. <coughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> Remember, we're coming back with him here. Whenever he comes back at the second coming, we're coming back with him. And so we're coming back at that time. Israel has been judged during this seven-year tribulation period. And, uh, and remember what Christ's uh, prophecy was to them, is that you'll not see me again until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so by the time they get through the tribulation period, believe me, they're going to be saying, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so they're going to recognize uh, him as Messiah, uh, those that are... Uh, that, are, that are alive, that have endured, or that have suffered martyrdom during this time because of their faith in Christ uh, are going to be redeemed. Uh, their iniquity is going to be taken away in a day. And they're going to be, again, um, in what type of body? Maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <clears throat> maybe, like the, maybe like the tribulation saints. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What about them? If they were saved. Yes, exactly. You know, uh, again, there's some false theology out there. She asked about the Jews during the, the Bible times. What about the Jews during the New Testament? Uh, and what Paul said was, I think this is in Romans chapter 9 or 10, uh, my heart's desire, desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And so their, their understanding, their zeal for God was based on what they had been revealed to them in the Old Testament. <coughs> Turn with me real quickly. Book of Hebrews. I want to show you something. I want to show you a very misunderstood, very misrepresented passage of Scripture. I've heard this passage of scripture used and, and if, I'm going to read it to you just without any context and, and, and maybe ask you what, you what your reaction to it is whenever you hear it out of the context that I'm about to, to give you because if you read it out of context uh, it, it really says something that is very contrary to what we teach and what we believe Okay, Hebrews chapter 10 says this 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. You'll, re you'll recognize this scripture. I'm sure you've heard it quoted before. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now, if you just hear that passage and you don't know anything about the kind, I don't know about you, but whenever I say, whenever I read when it says, For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment that's going to destroy the adversary. It's like, you know, have I sinned willfully since I've been saved? <laughs> so what does that mean? I, when you understand it, it is, it's, it's beautiful. I, I mentioned it when we talked about Hebrews uh, a couple of weeks ago. Who was, uh, who was the book of Hebrews written to? <laughs> it was written to the Hebrews. And it was written during a very unique time period. I think I may have mentioned this to you before. We're in a time period now. In the Old Testament, you were saved, as it were. You're, you're still saved by grace through faith, but it was by believing what God said concerning the law and concerning the sacrifices and the priests and all the things that you had to do. <coughs> you were saved under the law. You were kept under the law. We come to the age of grace and... We're no longer justified by the law, but we're justified by grace. We're saved through faith in Christ. But here in this particular period of time, Christ has died, he has resurrected, and redemption has been purchased, okay? That's happened. But here you are, you're in a remote area. They didn't have TV. They didn't have Fox News or CNN or Wi-Fi or anything like that. So the news doesn't just instantaneously get out to everyone. Okay? You with me so far? And so now you're a Jew, and as far as you know, you're doing everything that's required of you. You're still offering sacrifices. You're still trying to keep the law. You're still <laughs> that you've been told for generations that you were supposed to do. Because you don't know. You don't know that, that, that you're in a new dispensation. So, so you're still doing what you were supposed to be doing. Those people are still safe because they are responding to God with all the knowledge that they have in terms of what God expects out of them. But here comes the writer of the book of Hebrews that comes along, and he says, in these first ten chapters, I've explained to you that Christ is actually the fulfillment of the law, that he became that perfect sacrifice to pay the sin debt and to pay the penalty for your sins. Now that you have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. The lambs aren't going to cut it anymore. You no longer have the option of saying, this is the way Daddy did it, and this is the way granddaddy did it, and this is the way I'm going to do it. You know? You don't have that option anymore. Because he said in doing that, this is powerful. I mean, this is, you talk about cutting to the quick. To continue your sacrifice of the lamb, whenever you know that the Son of God has been sacrificed, of how much sore punishment suppose he shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He said, you, you don't have that option anymore. You can't continue under the old covenant now that you have heard about the new covenant. That's no longer an option for you. I said all of that because, number one, I just sort of wanted to point it out to you. And number two, I am still answering the question, which is, once the Jews receive knowledge, sacrifice of Christ, 
they have the same option as people do today. You accept it or you reject it. You either accept the sacrifice of Christ, that he paid the sin debt, that he paid for your sins, and you are saved. And by the way, you become a part of the church. There are Jewish believers today who are part of the body of Christ because they have been born again, they have been born of the Spirit, and they are part of the body of Christ. But the Jews who chose to remain in their Judaism to uh, the offering of Christ. The writer of the book of Hebrews and Paul in his writings says they have a zeal for God but it's not according to knowledge. And ignoring the righteousness that God has provided in Christ, they go about to establish their own righteousness. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. So the answer to your question is the Jews of the Bible days, once Christ had died and they became aware of the offering of Christ, then they were required at that point to either accept Christ and accept the sacrifice that he had made or else they were lost.